Now, with views you can trust and opinions you cannot ignore, the State of the Nation, next on Ave Verna 24. The following program on Ave Verna 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. State of the Nation is an opinion-based program. The thoughts and opinions shared within this program are not intended to offend or disregard anyone's perspectives or beliefs. We aim to foster open dialogue, encourage critical thinking, and explore thought-provoking subjects. Recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion, this program welcomes all viewpoints and cherishes the right to express them freely. This program also contains the opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Sri Lanka, the land of the confused. If you were living in 2009, soon after the war ended, and if someone said that in 2022 we would be a bankrupt nation, they would have laughed in their face. After all, every Sri Lankan back then had hope, purpose, and more importantly, an ability to dream for a better nation. After doing the same thing over and over again, gaining no credible results, and after it ended in bankruptcy, Sri Lankan leaders are doing their best to fail even more. Insanity, thy destination is a paradise island in the Indian Ocean. Also tonight, is the world heading for another pandemic as a new virus is taking over southern parts of India? For insights, analysis and opinions, tonight I'll speak to infectious disease expert from the University of Queensland, Australia, Professor Paul Griffin. Director of Critical Care and Nepal Virus Specialist Dr. Anup Kumar. Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgeon from Mount Elizabeth Medical Center in Singapore, Dr. Sivadasan Kumar Swami. Australian Barrister Julian Gillespie. State Minister of Finance Shehan Semasingha. The Chairwoman of the Sri Lanka Business National Alliance Tanya Abesundra. The Head of the Epidemiology Unit at the Ministry of Health. Dr. Samita Ginige and former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Kabra. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Joni and this is the State of the Nation. Good evening everyone, welcome to the State of the Nation, the show that ain't afraid to tackle hard-hitting issues and deliver unfiltered opinions to you. I'm here to guide you through the mayhem, dissect the chaos and bring you closer to the pulse of our nation. There's a lot to get through tonight, so let's get down to business. As far as I'm aware, I, I wasn't aware that he had direct involvement with Zafran. I was aware of that, that work that he did. In terms of his direct involvement with Zafran, <coughs> I, I can't. I can't really give you a, a good answer as to why, uh, as Abdullah was would be uh, the conduit for that meeting. Frankly, um, I, I don't have any evidence of the fact that the Zafran and Sa Sally met prior to that at all. I mean, Zafran was not active for during the eighties. He's, he's 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 around my age, so he would have been much younger then, of course. So uh, he wouldn't have had direct involvement with Sally during those years. NGJ, from what I understand, again, I will defer to people who know Sri Lanka much better than me, much more active later on in the early 2010s. So I, I don't think Sally would have necessarily had that, that bond in there. Well, that was the uh, producer and the filmmaker of the Colombo Liberals' groundbreaking documentary on the Easter Sunday Massacre. And what happened there was the makers of this fictitious piece of lousy journalism admitting that their key piece of accusation in the whole 47-minute documentary has no credible evidence. Tonight, I don't want to talk about them after all. They did have the humility and the sincerity to accept that they came up short. I commend them for that. We are not perfect humans after all. 
Now, the Cardinal also did say, don't worry, ask for forgiveness. We are ready to forgive. If you have made an error, just own up and we will forgive. There you go. The makers of the documentary confessed. Now, the Cardinal can keep true to his Christian word and forgive them. And let us also do the same right now. But tonight, I, what I want to focus is on the Colombo liberal idiot class and their swift move to believe whatever the bull that was dished out by these Western dookie holes. When this documentary came out, certain so-called respectable, I mean, honestly, they're just fake, untalented journalists who are practically married to American intelligence and along with their so-called human rights jokers who couldn't give two hoots about the rights of Sri Lankans but only cater to their interest groups. And of course, the LTTE-loving diaspora pumped individuals who claim to be rights activists. Now, all of them, without taking a millisecond to check, verify, or at least ask a couple of questions, jumped on the bandwagon to mislead their ill-informed followers just to stir hate. They hide behind this term, accountability. But as you can see, it later became a bunch of bull. I mean, accountability is an excellent concept. Shall we start with these idiots who ran with the Channel 4 bull to stir hate? Now, if you take a moment and check their socials, you will see this fact. All what they have to offer is hate. Hate for the country, hate for our leaders, hate for our military, hate for the whole idea of being a Sri Lankan. Hate, 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 hate. Perhaps this entire experience would have opened the eyes of some in this country who wants a better life for their children and future generations. I hope they actually would take steps to get away from the hate and embrace the love that this nation so desperately needs. We need to start loving our country. We need to start loving the idea of a better nation, better leaders, better systems, better quality of life, better opportunities, better lifestyles, and a better world for each and every one of us. We need not just love such an idea, but we also need to start putting them into action. As long as you follow those fake thought leaders, all you get in the end is the hate they teach you. And then you continue to be a slave to whatever they worship. Sri Lanka needs a new direction. And which direction is that? We all should get together and decide. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now in our lead story tonight, the Nipah virus grappling southern India and more importantly the critical question, are we here in Sri Lanka safe? After all, this country cannot afford another lockdown whatsoever. Now, Sri Lankan health officials say that currently there is no need to be alarmed as the government has taken uh, all steps to ensure that the virus does not enter this country. I mean, it sounds familiar but with an infectious disease, uh, it's a bit hard to contain them. If you have learned anything from the COVID pandemic, it is that we better be prepared than be surprised. So what is this deadly Nipah virus? Nipah was first identified in 1998 when pig farmers in Malaysia and Singapore began to fall ill. The outbreak ultimately killed more than 100 of the nearly 300 people infected. Scientists learned that humans can contract Nipah directly through contact with the bodily fluids of infected bats and pigs or through contaminated food, with some documented cases of transmission between humans. They suspect Nipah has existed for millennia among flying foxes and fear that a highly transmissible strain will emerge from bats. All right, now southern India, particularly the state of Kerala, has been reporting heavy cases. Uh, as per the data available, the outbreak has spread across India and several other Asian countries as the total death toll has reached more than 100 amid nearly 300 cases around uh, that region. 
let's get the latest uh, from our neighboring India and from the state of Kerala itself. Joining me now is the director of critical care at the Astor North North Hospital in Kerala, Dr. Anup Kumar. Dr. Kumar has been instrumental in identifying the outbreak in Kerala, not just uh, this year, but even in 2018. He joins me via Zoom right now. Thank you very much, Doctor. I, I know you are very busy at this moment. Um, now, tell us, what's the latest uh, from Kerala on the uh, Nipah virus? Uh, this year, uh, actually, we had uh, six cases of uh, Nipah. Uh, two, we couldn't uh, save them. So four are uh, absolutely all right. So they all tested uh, negative twice, and uh, they all got uh, discharged today. And there are no new more cases. So the outbreak is almost contained now indeed uh, doctor in your opinion do you see this breaking into a war scale emergency and what can countries like sri lanka do to safeguard uh, its citizens from this virus no not at all because uh, usually nipah virus uh, outbreak it is a self contained outbreak and the transmission uh, chances and the transmission rates come down like uh, as the cases progresses from uh, uh, first degree to second degree so it is unlikely to uh, spread into a larger group of uh, people. And as I've already told, uh, the situation is already under control and the disease is already contained. Uh, how it is important in Sri Lanka is, like uh, this are reservoir of these uh, Nipah viruses are fruit bags. And that is seen in all Southeast Asian countries. So it is only reported in Bangladesh and uh, uh, two states in India, West Bengal and Kerala, that doesn't mean it is limited to those areas alone. Definitely the countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, other all Southeast Asian countries where these fruit bats of Europa species are there, they're all prone for this disease. Usually uh, this will come into very um, uh, like minor numbers, maybe uh, like this time four to six. So you may be missing these cases. So you should, your clinician should be aware how to pick up these cases and you should have uh, the facility in your country to test for these Nipah viruses, especially uh, when you are treating encephalitis and uh, just, uh, respiratory infections when you are not having a proper diagnosis. So like you didn't diagnose it so far doesn't mean that you are not getting outbreak because you are not uh, looking into that possibility. So that point I think should be highlighted. And it should not affect your uh, country's other uh, like export, import, all those things as well. So put it in a milder way, the questions, but uh, your health system and people should be aware that there is such disease, what are the symptoms, and when the people should be aware and how it is getting transmitted from bats to human beings. Those are the important things rather than uh, like just worrying uh, whether it is getting transmitted from Kerala to other parts. And it is now, it is only limited to uh, one district in Kerala not even gone beyond uh, that district. Indeed, all right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, that was Dr. Anup Kumar, the Director of Critical Care at the Astor North Hospital in Kerala in uh, Southern India. Now, when the COVID pandemic broke out in early of 2020, the world was taken by surprise and the process of making vaccines was put to the test. Right now, many people around the world are questioning the efficacy of those vaccines for COVID-19 while in some instances, legal action has been mitigated. Later on in the show, I will speak to one such lawyer from Australia who's leading a case against two major vaccine companies. However, a good thing that COVID did was to awaken the scientific community to the possibility of pandemic scale viruses the world over that, would, uh, that we would experience in the future. So they went to work, not just focusing on COVID-19, but other viruses that could bring the entire world to a standstill, like the Nipah virus. Now, India is sourcing monoclonal antibodies um, named M102.4. Now, this novel drug therapy is under evaluation for treating Nipah virus infection. It has been used on a compassionate basis in some countries, exported from Australia itself, to treat persons affected by the disease, and that is now happening in the state of Kerala as well. The drug, M102.4, was initially developed to treat Henipa virus, another bad borne disease. Early stage trials by the University of Queensland in Australia have shown that the M102.4 can help manage Nipah virus, which is also a bad-born uh, and highly fatal uh, virus. 
So what are these monoclonal antibodies and why is India reaching out to Australia? Let's get uh, some clarity on that. Joining me now from Brisbane, Australia, where Zoom is Professor Paul Griffin, the Director of Infectious Disease at the Meta Health Services at the University of Queensland. Thank you very much, Professor, for being here. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, what exactly is this monoclonal antibody exchange? Is it is it a possible answer to the Nipah virus? Can we contain it before it becomes a big issue? Yeah, thanks, Mahesh, and thanks very much for having me on. I mean, we know the Nipah virus situation is one that's very significant, and unfortunately, we have very few options in terms of vaccines or treatments. But fortunately, we had an issue with a, a very similar virus here in Australia called Hendra, and a large collaborative effort established these antibodies. So think of it like a, a vaccine, but instead of relying on your body to make the antibodies to protect you, these antibodies have been made in a laboratory, and they, they target what's called the G-glycoprotein, which is something on the surface of the virus and, and that blocks it invading our cells. So it's something that particularly if given very early after exposure or infection can, can make a big difference to people's trajectory with this virus. And because as I say, it's the only thing that we have at the moment. It is a pretty nasty virus. It's uh, fortunate that we've been able to share those antibodies. So hopefully people can get a benefit over there as well. Indeed, uh, Professor, is this outbreak similar uh, to the COVID outbreak? Why am I, uh, why I'm asking this is, uh, are we looking at another shutdown due to another health crisis the world over? This virus is very different to COVID, and I think it's people understand the differences. I mean, it's a nasty virus, and, you know, it has a very high mortality rate. It's quoted as between 40 and 75. But, in fact, that's a, a useful thing in terms of its ability, or our ability to limit its spread, because if people are really sick, they're easy to be identified, easy to be isolated, and less likely to transmit. And studies over a long time have shown that, you know, usually over only a third or less of people with this virus will transmit it, whereas that was many times higher with COVID. And of course, the big difference is how it's transmitted. This is transmitted through uh, blood or bodily fluids. It's not respiratory. So it's not likely to, to spread in the community very easily. And given that the body fluids requirement for, for transmission, simple precautions to limit contact with those can also address spread. So yeah, this is very different to COVID, but certainly one we need to watch closely and, and try and contain as quickly as possible. Indeed, uh, Professor, uh, finally, in your opinion, uh after the uh, whole COVID-19 experience, how better do you think we can face this crisis as a global community? We have learned a lot. We understand a lot more about all sorts of different viruses. And I think people are a bit more attuned to, to taking steps to try and isolate these sorts of viruses. So, you know, again, understanding what the threat is and the steps to, to address it is really important. I think we've improved there. And our ability to manufacture these antibodies, for example, is something that, you know, 20 years ago or so, we probably wouldn't have been able to do to the, the same level that we have. So our ability to combat them is certainly better, but we still do need to continue to, to learn lessons and and improve our response so that we minimise the probability of these sorts of things happening in the future. Indeed. All right. We have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, Professor Paul Griffin, the Director of Infectious Disease uh, at the Meta Health uh, Services from the University of Queensland. Thank you very much. So the next big question is, well, is Sri Lanka safe? Or are we safe like how we were safe from COVID-19? The person who's responsible for this is the Minister of Health. Well, we did call him and asked him about the preparations for the matter, and he said to consult the Director General of the Health Department. Again, we did just that. He then said to talk to the head of the Epidemiology Unit, Dr. Samitha Girige. This is what he had to say. <laughs> Golia washing him a patriarchy and our dam, make Kerala, that you may salute me, Sankia, Golia, Vasangata, Technetal, Anitra, Tolu, the patriarchy in the Kada, Sape, Cheva, Itamat, Adu, Itihinisa, Api, Sri Lankan Hatter, making Apitamat, Sakamat and Shaki, the Mipilban, Itamat, our dining in my Kerala Vedim, Kadikila Pitamat, our dining in the Locus of Kisang, the Hanitit in Hamade, Ganam, Abashaturu, Ratala, Bedaharino, in Tavama, Apate Hima, Rata. විශාල අවදානමක් තියෙන තත්යක් ඉසිසේත්ම මේ තත්ය තුල ඇති වෙලා නැහැ. ඒ කියන්නේ නිසා අනවශ්‍ය අනියත බියක් මේ අවස්ථාවේ ඇති කර ගැනීම කිසිසේත්ම මේ අවශ්‍ය වෙන්නේ නැහැ. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the state of the nation back in a moment.
Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Let's get the latest on the economy after the IMF team came to assess what we did with the first tranche of the bailout package. Well, according to them, we fell short in certain instances, but the government seems to be uh, very confident that we certainly will get the second tranche as well. Despite saying that all is well, the indicators of our economy are showing a different picture. The government said uh, that the IMF-backed financial plan that is being pushed by them is working. In order for our economy to come out of this crisis, we need to find ways and means of growing our economy. However, in the second quarter of 2023, our economy contracted by another 3.1%, meaning we are not growing, we are shrinking. However, many financial analysts in the region indicate that Sri Lanka's tough times are still ahead. And who's going to feel those hard times? Certainly not the top tier of our society. They're fine. That's why they love this IMF back plan because it helps them more. But the SMEs, the middle to lower income category of our society, well, they are the ones who will take the hit. Listen to what uh, the Sri Lanka Business National Alliance Chairwoman Tanya Abhisundra told us earlier. Watch. Thank you, Mahesh, for your question. Help in the SMV sector in what way that I would want to ask a question back from the government because the policies that the government has implemented as no and never so far has helped the SME at all. Uh, if the government wants to uh, help the SMV, they have to directly intervene into a condition that is being implemented by the government themselves. Today, the government policies that has been taken overall is affecting the SMEs, not the international companies, not the multinational companies, not the blue chip companies, but only it is affecting the SMEs. Because for the simple reason, they have to realize the consumer market relies within the country. So this market is being suppressed to a level with unnecessary, unethical, unprecedented decisions taken by the government. Today, if the government wants to help the SMEs, they have to realize in bringing down the interest, bringing down the utility bills. Now the government is expecting to increase utility bills another 25%. How can that be helping? So it is helping themselves to run the government, not to run the country. Well, that was the uh, chairwoman of the Sri Lanka Business National Alliance, Tanya Abhisundra, speaking to us earlier. Now, you do the math. Are you in an excellent financial status where you are quite comfortable uh, going without any difficulties? Or is your head is on fire trying to figure out expenses for this month? Now, the IMF team ended its first tranche assessments uh, and they left the country and uh, they put out a statement on their way out. While the first paragraph praised the efforts of the government, sandwiched between praises is the key component of the visit. They're basically asking us to read between the lines. They really stated it, and I quote, The authorities have met the program's primary balance targets and remains committed to this important pillar of the program so as to support their efforts to restore debt sustainability. However, Revenue mobilization gains, while improved relatively to last year, are expected to fall short of initial projections by nearly 15% by the year end. While partially due to economic factors, the onus of fiscal adjustments would fall on public expenditure if there were no efforts to recoup the shortfall. What they are trying to say is that because you didn't do this exactly how the IMF said to the letter, the plan is going to fail, and then it's not the IM, IMF's fault. Let's get the latest on these negotiations. And joining me now is the State Minister of Finance, Shahan Samisinga. Thank you very much, Minister, for your time. Uh, Minister, uh, where are we with regard to the second tranche discussions with the IMF? Well, uh, firstly, we'll have to uh, conclude the first review, which is in progress right now. We have achieved uh, progress in the review. There are a few points that uh, we need to discuss further, both authorities, that is uh, the IMF team and the authorities of uh, Sri Lanka. Especially, uh, the main concern was uh, whether we are getting the expected revenues. I think uh, we are uh, finding alternate uh, measures to find uh, revenue. Uh, we are, there is a shortfall in the revenue. So once we relax importation restrictions by 
next month we will be able to uh, get additional revenue of course i must say that uh, vehicles will not be relaxed uh, as at now and then uh, tax administration needs to be strengthened that is something which we have identified because we have not got the required uh, tax base uh, enhancement as we anticipated but however the remit system which is in existence uh, right now will get strengthened and uh, they will uh, upgrade their system to make uh, make uh, or basically eliminate human interaction between the tax authorities and the tax payers so that will happen within the next uh, couple of weeks i think once we are done with those uh, measures we will get uh, the anticipated revenues because uh, the uh, i mean uh, down trend of low uh, of uh, government revenue was one of the key uh, concerns on the economic crisis so we'll have to take all measures uh, to ensure that we don't uh, get back to a crisis situation Minister, finally, uh, despite the upbeat mood of the government on the economy, uh, many analysts in the region are predicting that the rupee to once again uh, reach new lows, more economic uh, contractions, and a really tough time for the middle-income class. Your response? But I think, uh, firstly, the comparison should come with regards to twenty, uh, with regards to the situation in twenty twenty two. You, when you are comparing the situations, please ensure that uh, you don't ignore. Uh, what was in existence in 2022 so that was the uh, height of the crisis but if you see we don't see uh, that amount of difficulties but however there are further difficulties which are being faced by the general public which the government is addressing so we are expecting the economy uh, to get further strengthened by the end of the year that basically uh, by the end of the last quarter of 2023 and uh, we are very confident that we will go in for a growth in 2024 so yes we went into a crisis we are emerging from the crisis so if somebody wants to compare how we have emerged and then a non crisis period i think uh, it is not a reasonable comparison i know there are a very limited group trying to see all the negative aspects of the recovery process but majority of uh, people wants to see the economy doing well and for them to do well so that is what our concern and we will ensure that we get a better economy in 2024 and definitely go in for a growth in 2024 indeed all right thank you uh, let's leave it at that that was the state minister of finance shaham sam singh a great now more state of the nation right after this back in a minute Welcome back everyone to the state of the nation. Now last year remember the Colombo economic pundits were telling us that uh, Sri Lanka's addiction to money printing was one of the reasons that Sri Lanka's economy was in such dire straits. I mean they're right to a certain extent. But remember how they accused the former government, the former governor and the rest of the uh, rest for printing money left right and center. The current governor who was brought in in my opinion to default the country said during that crisis we will stop doing that no more money printing strict restrictions on that matter in fact the imf clearly outlined no more money printing as well because it negatively impacts the economy and that's a fact but here's the raw data treasury bills issued to the central bank by the government referred to as this money printing business uh, to the value of 1206 billion rupees were made in the 551 days since the central bank's covid driven monetary accommodation of the government from the 13th march 2020 to 14th uh, september 2021 while professor uh, wd lakshman was the governor as a result the treasury bills holdings of the central bank uh, increased to 1284 billion rupees by 14th september 2021 now thereafter during uh, governor ajit nivar kabral's term from the 15th of september 2021 to the 5th of april 
The Treasury bill holdings or money printing increased by 446 billion rupees to reach 1730 billion rupees. But as per the latest data, the total central bank holdings of government treasury bills and bonds have reached a phenomenal 2839 billion rupees by 22nd September 2023. Now, on that basis, money printing under the current governor, Dr. Nandalal Veerasinghe, has reached 1,171 billion rupees, even after a nearly three-fold increase in T-bills and bond rates since assuming office, and not paying external debt of about $7,000 million so far. Meaning, we printed money, but we didn't even uh, you know, pay our debt. In addition, the central bank indicators reveal that money printing on uh, a single day, uh, specifically on the 21st of September 2023, recorded a staggering 334 billion rupees. Let's actually uh, try to understand uh, why Sri Lanka needs to immediately get rid of this bad habit and focus uh, more on, on credible solutions that would help us to get out of this crisis. Let's cross over to the data board. That's where we find economist Imran Furkan. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, thank you very much for being here once again. Uh, I understand uh, your lovely wife was uh, in Sri Lanka for a short visit from Australia. She was. And, uh, uh, and she ran back after spending, what, one week with you? Uh, well, actually, she extended her stay, so it, I think it's a very positive side. <laughs> anyway, Imran, uh, explain to us why this money printing business is going to keep us down in the depths. Yeah, thanks, Mahesh. So, um, you know, um, the popular term money printing looks at really, you know, treasury, uh, CBSL, Treasury Bill and Bond Holdings, um, uh, but it's a bit of a broader term, and I'll explain that. But first, the worrying thing, um, you know, between this one day, uh, you know, we've been printing uh, just over 300, uh, you know, third, uh, almost 340 billion rupees, which is which is something we promised to stop, right? Um, now, of course, this does not necessarily mean uh, there is an overall increase in in what we call. Uh, you know what we call money printing in an official way. So, in a technical term, the governor is right. Uh, that would be reserve money, right? Now, reserve money is, is a complicated thing that includes, uh, you know, the treasure, central bank holding of treasury bills and bonds. Um, it also includes other things like open market operations where you know uh, um, securities could be bought and sold, uh, central bank holdings of foreign currency. Um, and also the changing of assets, uh, domestic assets uh, held by the central bank as well. So if you look at from an overall perspective, technically uh, what he says is true because um, you know after a big jump uh, in uh, you know 2020 um, from 2020 to 2021, where we uh, you know actually printed 344 billion rupees, um, there's only a smaller jump between 2021 and 2022. Um, which was about 44 billion rupees, right? And in 2023, so far, uh, just keep an eye out uh, for this figure of 1. Point, uh, you know, 1.35 trillion uh, rupees. Um, you know, if you if you um, look at the um, uh, figure up to um, you know end of 2022, and and also. Um, up to end of July 2023. Now, this is the latest figures we have uh, from from the central bank. I think August and September will come. Um, reserve money is at 1.37 trillion. So, not a huge amount overall has been printed. Um, but still, it's 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 negative. It's not the way to go. It's not the way to go, and the way to go is simple, right? We need to not print. Or the the central bank should not be financing government spending. This is where where this holding of the treasury bills, uh, you know, have increased dramatically. That should be done by uh, either tax revenue going up or expenses coming down, which I think is what we need to focus on. Not not create these you know, fake money uh, exactly. into the system, exactly. which is uh, impacting uh, negatively. Very quickly, uh, Imran, uh, um, I mean, right now, Sri Lanka, uh, I mean, even if you look at the United States, they're doing the same thing. Yes. Uh, they're printing left, right and center because the US dollar is a, a, a dominating currency all around the world and they are the only uh, country that can do um, the printing. 
So uh, what can we learn from that if we are to get out of this crisis? Because there is an impending crisis in the United States as well, uh, if they continuously keep doing that, but their economy is very stronger than ours. But uh, for us, in order to get out, you, I mean, you just uh, indicated a couple of things, but what is the other thing that we really need to focus on? Yeah, I think just to correct you on one thing, the U.S. may be printing money at record levels. It's actually reduced the amount of money they're printing. Uh, they still are, but the, you know, the pace has reduced, and they're increasing interest rates, which we are not doing. We are actually reducing interest rates, so the, uh, a little different from, from what we are doing, and therefore their currency is quite strong now. Right? What we need to focus on is a couple of things. Either we need to reduce the size of you know, the government and government spending, which we are not doing. Um, absolutely no action has been taken to spend, you know, reduce the size of government or the spending. And we need to also increase our revenues, right? Uh, either tax revenues or other revenues that are coming in. I think we are not focusing on both of them. Even the IMF, after its recent review, they just left. Uh, they, have, they have some concerns that we have not met our revenue target. So I think we need to increase uh, you know, revenue and also cut costs at the same time, preferably cut costs faster than we increase our revenue, um, uh, uh, you know, and that, that without you know, taxing us a lot. Um, but we cannot keep, uh, you know, the central bank exactly. cannot keep funding the government expenditure. Exactly. All right, economist Imran Furkan, thank you. Now, I want to bring in the uh, former governor of the central bank, Ajit Nimad Kabral, who has also been accused of this bad habit. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor, for joining me and taking the time to speak to us. Now, when you printed money, all hell broke loose, at least that's what the economic pundits of uh, Colombo said. However, as soon as you left, money printing magically became something good. And the current central bank administration seems to be enjoying doing that, just that. Now explain to us, Governor, we know this activity is negatively uh, impacting the economy. What else can we actually look into right now amidst a thick economic crisis? Thank you, Mahesh, for having me on your program. It's always good to be with you. Now, if you look at money printing per se, during the time of the COVID, every single central bank in every part of the world had to print money. That was because of the fact that every country had a loss in revenues because of the lockdowns, because of the economic activity being curtailed. Every government had a shortfall in their revenues and that had to be compensated with the central banks providing them with some liquidity. Now, during the time that I was the governor, it had to happen. And the research of many central banks all over the world, including the Reserve Bank of India, showed very clearly that in times of crisis of that nature, when there were economic contractions, that the impact of additional treasury bill holdings of the central bank did not negatively impact the inflation. So, we had a very interesting situation at that time where we had to provide with liquidity and at the same time the provision of liquidity itself did not lead to the normal occurrence of the inflation going up. However, after I left the impact of COVID had reduced drastically and there was in fact no COVID impact at all. But at that time the, then set, the new administration had increased the interest rates they had increased, the government had increased the taxes manifold. So there were new revenues coming in. They were not paying the foreign debt. And the local debt was also uh, being uh, accumulated with the treasury bill holdings being taken by the government. So there was a very different set of scenarios. And even, even in, under those circumstances, we found that the money printing had gone up tremendously. In fact, the new administration so far has printed something like 1.2 trillion rupees. And as you say, the people are not too concerned about it because the people who were concerned when during my term, when we printed around 446 billion, they are very quiet. You're, you cannot find them. They are not saying Cabral printed 446 billion and now the current administration is printing 1.2 trillion. They are very quiet about it. I don't know why, but that's the truth. So the long and short of this whole exercise is that money printing at the current time is actually not in the best interest of the country because there is no COVID and you have to manage without, without this kind of support, which is what we did. 
up right up to the in in my nine years as the Treasury Bank Governor, there was not a single cent that was there at the time that I left as uh, Treasury Bill Holdings. So it can be done, but nowadays we find that it is not being done. But nobody seems to be too concerned about it. Indeed, uh, Governor, the IMF along with uh, many economic pundits say that 2024 is going to be a uh, year of recovery, um, the year that Sri Lanka's economy will bounce back. Your thoughts? You see, Mahesh, we are seeing huge interest rates today. It has come down a little bit, but at the current interest rates, I don't think you are going to see any growth. With the current default, status that Sri Lanka is having, I don't see anyone coming and investing in Sri Lanka. With the current political turmoil that we are seeing, with so many different factions pulling in so many different directions, I don't think even the local investors would be investing in order to spur growth in our country. With the current IMF program, which is so stringent, with huge taxes, with huge burdens being cast upon the people, I don't think we are going to see any current local activity which will also spur growth. We are seeing also a huge brain drain, the likes of which, which we have never seen in the past. And if we think that with those conditions that you are going to see growth, I think you are really, really optimistic. Absolutely. All right. We have to leave it at that. Former Governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Kaprav. Thank you very much, sir. A short break now. More State of the Nation right after this. everyone to the state of the nation now we want to follow up on a story we brought to you a couple of weeks back where we reported that many young adults worldwide are experiencing heart related issues in Sri Lanka alone over 100 to 150 young adults uh, visit the emergency room daily with concerns over heart matters many scientists are pointing the finger uh, at COVID-19 but more importantly the vaccines after all the uh, many coming into the emergency room are not individuals who had COVID-19 but had the jab. Joining me now to discuss more on this further is uh, Dr. Sivathasan Kumar Swami, a world-renowned cardiothoracic surgeon from the Mount Elizabeth Medical Center in Singapore. He joins me via Zoom um, from Singapore itself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for being here. Doctor, why have there recently been lots of cardiac episodes reported from young adults, not just in Sri Lanka, but around the world? Why do you think this is? Well, myocarditis, the common, one of the things that happens is myocarditis. And it has been happening in about 10 per 100,000 population. Uh, and uh, it is often following a viral infection, any infection, like influenza and all that. But uh, those are, as I said, is uncommon, very uncommon. And uh, most patients would recover spontaneously with the breast and all that, right? So uh, now it has come to a, people are getting more aware of it because there were a few incidents of myocarditis reported after the COVID vaccinations. So that's a reason probably people are getting more aware of it and more publicity is being given to this. Indeed, uh, Dr. Certain members of the scientific community and of course the public are alluding that uh, the issues have to do with the vaccine. Your thoughts on that matter? Okay, uh, but, uh, but I can talk is what's happening in Singapore because I'm more familiar with it. So, uh, as I said, myocarditis is an illness associated with the in, uh, infection, including COVID, and also can occur after vaccination. And uh, generally, it, when it occurs, it's mostly the young males between 12 to 30 years old. And the local, as in Singapore incidence uh, related myocarditis in this group is uh, 0.1 per 100,000 doses uh, of uh, following vaccination. 
So as of uh, April 2023, uh, more than 17 million COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered in Singapore. And there were 160 reports of myocarditis or inflammation of the covering of the heart known as pericarditis linked to this vaccine. So out of 17 million, only 160 reports. Uh, and uh, of these patients, 32% of them initially had symptoms within one day of vaccination. Another 20 reported, 20% uh, reported within two days, and another 24% reported within one week. So the majority of myocarditis from vaccinations are generally mild and respond to treatment, mostly rest, right? Uh, so the uh, the best data probably internationally comes from, probably from Israel. Uh, we are the Israel Ministry of Health posted the data about 121 myocarditis uh, cases occurring within 30 days of a second dose of mRNA vaccine out of 5 million uh, Persons. So this is the true incidence of myocarditis. As you see, it's not common, it's uncommon, uh, and, and it occurs uh, like even without COVID or related to COVID also occurs in the community too, but yes. All right, we have to leave it at that. That was uh, Dr. Sivathasan Kumar Swami from the Mount Elizabeth Medical Center in Singapore. Thank you. Now in Australia, several vaccine makers are getting sued due to their inability to be honest about the vaccines. An Australian doctor and pharmacist is seeking an injunction from the federal court to stop Pfizer and Moderna from distributing their mRNA vac COVID-19 vaccines. The case alleges that Pfizer and Moderna were reckless and negligent for failing to apply for the appropriate license before dealing with their mRNA COVID-19 vaccine products in Australia amounting to a serious criminal offence. Joining me now via Zoom from Sydney, Australia, is former attorney Julian Gillespie. Mr. Julian Gillespie is a retired lawyer and former barrister who has uh, come out of retirement to fight the legal battle against uh, these COVID-19 vaccines in Australia. Now, he strongly believes that the Australian people have not been given accurate information about these vaccines. He's also part of the team of lawyers prosecuting against Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in Australia. Well, thank you very much, sir, for being here. It is very evident that you are moving towards such legal action against these uh, companies who have raked up, uh, I think, billions or trillions of dollars around the world by selling their vaccines as the solution for COVID-19 in haste. What's the basis of your case? It's very straightforward. Thank you, uh, Mahesh. Uh, we looked at the gene technology legislation here in Australia, and that legislation is found in many countries around the world, and it's are quite identical in many other countries. And we just looked at the legal definitions for what uh, is, is deemed to be a genetically modified organism. And when we scratched the surface and understood the, the proper me method of action of the, uh, the LNPs dash mod RNA, um, <clears throat> it became clear after consultation with various uh, PhDs in molecular and cellular biology, that the legal definitions totally uh, capture uh, the the main constituents of these so-called vaccines. We don't believe they're vaccines at all, but non-vaccines. Uh, so the ramifications there are quite simple. Pfizer and Moderna uh, were required to place applications in a separate uh, government office in this country, the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator, and seek genetic GMO, what's called GMO licenses, the, the legal right to deal uh, with genetically modified organisms in Australia. And it's not the first time this has occurred. AstraZeneca, uh, they came out with their so-called COVID-19 vaccine. The method of action for AstraZeneca was very clear from the outset. They were indeed always saying that they were going to target entry into the cell nucleus in order to stimulate um, the creation of the so-called spike protein or the synthetic spike protein. And because they said they're going into the nucleus first, well, that was a, a signal that their product is a genetically modified organism. So they sought a GMO um, license and they had to undergo a stringent GMO risk assessment to see if these things posed any harm to the Australian population. They ended up receiving 
a GMO uh, license and then we could subsequently go on and seek approval. Um, <clears throat> but Pfizer and Moderna failed to take a similar path and seek those licenses. A, a failure is to seek those licenses and to then deal with a product without a license amounts to a serious criminal offence in this country. And that's what we want to seek to bring them to account for. All right, let's leave it at that. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Julian Gillespie, former Australian attorney. Let's take a short break. I'll return with the closing. We are all well aware Sri Lanka will head for the polls next year to select a new leader or to ratify the old. Whatever is said and done, the next president has the arduous task of bringing Sri Lanka out of this crisis. As we have uh, learned and understood, one person alone cannot do it. It must be a nationwide attempt to get this country back on track. But who will lead us? Who will inspire us to rise above the challenges and unite us towards a common goal? We need a leader who can ignite the flames of hope. A leader who can bring out the best in every citizen. We need a leader who can inspire an entire nation, who can inspire the very citizens of our nation who are leaving in record numbers to stay and fight for a better future here in Sri Lanka. After all, the grass is green where you water it. Throughout Sri Lanka's history, great leaders have emerged in times of adversity. They found strength in unity and turned moments of despair into opportunities for growth. Today, we need a leader who can do the same again for Sri Lanka. But let's not forget, as citizens, we too have a role to play. We must come together, shoulder to shoulder, to rebuild our economy, to invest in our future. It's not just the duty of the government or a single leader. It's our collective responsibility. Let's remember that change begins with us in our homes, our workplace, our communities. Like the great Mahatma Gandhi said, let's be the change you wish to see in the world. To share your waves, suggestions and thoughts, do get in touch with us as we would like to hear from you. You can write to us about anything you saw on the program. You agree, disagree, please send us your comments to stateofthenation at derana.lk. I'm Mahish Johnny. From all of us at Other Derana 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you on Tuesday on Get Fit.